Stephen Caskey was a bivocational Southern Baptist pastor here in Louisiana. I don't think he ever served a church you've heard of. All of them, very small. He greatly valued and prized education, but because of his responsibilities to provide for a family and because he never served any church of what most would call significance, he was never able to get much formal theological education. But just because your ministry doesn't reach thousands doesn't mean it has significance. And someone who loved and appreciated his character, his consistency, his endurance, uh, wanted to pay tribute to him. He did not have a long life, but someone wanted to pay tribute to him, and so they created the Caskey Center for Church Excellence with a scholarship program that pays all the tuition and fees for uh, any recipient through whatever degree they want to get, uh, undergraduate or master's degree uh, or certificates. Also providing the Logos software, con a conference like this for any small church uh, pastor that wanted to come, scholarship recipient or not, and all the things we've done. I just want you to know that you don't know who's in your congregation or community observing your life and your ministry. And you may never be on the program of the Southern Baptist Convention. And you may never be someone that lots and lots of people know. That doesn't mean you're not having a ministry of great significance. And we're grateful for those who have recognized they do not know your names, but they love you. They love you. And they believe in you. And for those of you who are scholarship recipients, the thing that they really love and cherish, they appreciate your thank you notes, and I hope you've taken the time, or will before you leave, to write a little thank you note uh, to this family. They would absolutely uh, kill me in the horrible ways if I ever shared their name with you. Uh, they do not want to be known, but they would appreciate, uh, they do love your, the thank you notes that people send to them, and we'll get it to them. They especially love the stories of when you have a gospel conversation. And they have kept every one of those. And they love reading those stories of your gospel conversation. So uh, on their behalf, let me just say to you, you matter to God. And you matter to them. And you matter to the people you're serving, whether it looks like they notice or not. You matter. Thank you for what you're doing. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not any of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who renews your youth like the eagle, through tender acts of kindness. Are you going to stay on the path all the way home? I'm not supposed to be here today. It's supposed to be somebody else. But they made some terrible moral choices and they couldn't come breaks my heart it's a friend if you were to ask me what was the darkest chapter of your life it would have been when my wife's father who was one of the most famous Christians in America an evangelist second only to Billy Graham made some horrible moral choices blew up our family devastated us. Are you going to stay on the path all the way home? How do you do that? A very simple answer. Don't sin. Okay. How many of you know that? Don't sin. Does everybody know that? Okay. How many of you think every pastor in the history of the world knows don't sin? Do you think everybody knows that? Okay. So it's not enough to know that. Because we are human beings, we are every one of us capable of any form of sin and disobedience to God, act of cruelty in others, uh, 
Horrible things happened in World War II with the Nazi death camps when 10 million Jews were savagely murdered and exterminated and they were having trials after World War II for the war criminals who ran those death camps. One of the most famous of them, infamous I should say, Adolf Eichmann. And during his trial, of one of the survivors of the death camp he ran gave eloquent testimony against him. And as the trial proceeded, he was sitting in the courtroom and he blacked out and had to be carried out of the courtroom. On an anniversary of the trial of Eichmann, he was being interviewed on TV. I, got, I was just happened to be watching the interview. And the reporter asked the question, if I remember, you blacked out during the course of Eichmann's trial and had to be carried from the courtroom. Is that correct? He said, yes, that's correct. He said, just curious, what happened? Were you ill or any, what happened? He said, when Adolf Eichmann would walk through that camp with his spit and polish uniform and shoes so shiny you could use them as a mirror. He looked like a cold, cruel God who had the power of life and death over all of us and he did not care and I hated him. He said, but in that courtroom as I looked over into the box where they were keeping him, I saw there the eyes of a scared, frightened man and suddenly I realized that given the same set of circumstances, I could have done what he did and the realization that I was capable of that kind of evil devastated me and I blacked out. If you don't think you're capable of getting off the path, you've already taken a step in that direction. So how are you gonna stay on the path all the way home. I think Psalm 103 gives us a great hint. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not any of his benefits. Very interesting. Nearly all the times that term bless is used, it is used of a deity giving the blessing to some person or persons. God is doing the blessing. He's the subject. He's the blessor. But here this is talking about the psalmist. The psalmist is talking about his soul. It's you and it's me. Bless the Lord because you see a blessing is something that you give out of yourself. And the psalmist is calling upon us to bless the Lord, to give God something he doesn't have until we give it, and that is our blessing. Does God need it? No, I think he's going to do okay if we don't give it to him. Does God want it? Yes. But even a bigger question than that, do you need to bless the Lord? And I would say very much so. Let me make this statement. I want you to think about it. What you give to the Lord is more important than what you do for the Lord. Now let me say that again. What you give to the Lord is more important than what you do for the Lord. Do you know you can do for the Lord while you are sinning against him? Do you know you can do for the Lord while you are ignoring your family? Do you know you can do for the Lord and use your doing for the Lord as a reason why you're not more obedient to the Lord? What you give to the Lord is more important than what you do for the Lord. For in the act of giving to the Lord, there is not going to be sin. But if the focus of your life is doing for the Lord, that will not necessarily take you to a healthy place. You can overdo. You can do the right thing at the wrong time. You can do the wrong thing at the right time. You can do the wrong thing at the wrong time. In lots of ways, you and I can take the doing for the Lord and it not necessarily turn out 
the way God wants it to turn out. So the psalmist doesn't say, do something for the Lord in terms of an act of service. What he says is, bless the Lord. Give the Lord your blessing. Those of you who are married guys, I don't know if you talk to your uh, wife's parents seeking their blessing for your marriage, but I did. And that was a pretty scary thing to do, a little intimidating. Don't ask my wife to tell you the story. She has a very vivid imagination. But anyway, it was a memorable moment. I wanted their blessing. They gave me their blessing. Bless the Lord with who you are, with all that you are, bless the Lord. While you are blessing the Lord, you will be filled with the knowledge and awareness of the Lord that will be continually deeping your love and your obedience and your eager desire to be all that he wants you to be. Why do we bless the Lord? And the psalmist says, I'll give you the reason why. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless his holy name. And that Hebrew word literally means all your internal organs are engaged in blessing the Lord. Your whole being is engaged in blessing the Lord. You know the difference between you and me playing softball for the church softball team and a major league batter playing professional baseball, being paid millions of dollars to swing a bat and hit a ball like you do for free for your church softball team? When you go to your church softball team, you probably hit that softball mostly with your arms, maybe a little bit with your shoulder. But those professional baseball players, they have learned how to put their entire body and weight into that swing. It's the bat speed of their wrist, how fast their wrist move. It's the rotating of their hips. It's all of their shoulders. It's all of their arm. It's every component of their body that is engaged in making contact with that ball, and that's when it goes out of the ballpark. They don't just hit the ball. They hit it with everything they have. And the psalmist is saying to you and to me, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. With everything you have, bless the Lord. Why? He pardons all of your iniquities. Isn't that great? All. It doesn't matter. There's no differentiate. Now, this kind of sin, God has to really think about. That kind of sin, sure, that's an easy one. God has no grace. There's sin and there's not sin. And if there is any form of sin, it is all under the same condemnation. It is less than what God wants. It is automatically earning us the wrath of God, the eternity in hell. It offends God in every kind of way. He's a holy, perfect, righteous God. Any sin against God is a stench in his nostrils. And what does God do? do with all your sin, he pardons it through Christ and his marvelous sacrifice as our substitute. And he pardons it not for a day or a week, but forever. My sweet wife's father, I told you, made horrible moral choices. He was a completely different man, was away from the Lord for 18 years. After 18 years, he literally showed up on our doorstep right here on the seminary campus and for several months lived with us, and we got to watch God put him back together again, which was one of the great privileges of our lives. The last few years of his life, he lived with Rhonda's sister in Oklahoma. And for the last couple of years, he had dementia, I guess is the easiest thing to say. And Rhonda would go to see him every chance she could, and she was there visiting one time. And by now, he was under 24-hour nursing care, and Rhonda walked into his room, the television was on, and it was on the Jerry Springer show. And they were having their typical yelling, screaming, shouting uh, kind of fights, and it was about divorce. And Rhonda came in and said, Dad, why don't we change the channel and look at something else? And after they changed the channel and they started talking a little bit, her dad suddenly looked over and said, you know, isn't it great? that no one in our family has ever had a divorce. And Rhonda's thinking he has no idea what he's done with his life. He's been divorced twice, horrible choices, but every mistake he ever made was gone from his mind. And she called me that night 
and said, I really learned something about forgiveness today. When God forgives, it's gone. Yes, sir. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name who pardons all of our iniquities, who heals all of our diseases. And you and I know that the great, sovereign, wonderful Lord is capable of intervening and doing things that medical science cannot do and healing people of any form of disease. Jesus did it. We saw it through Scripture, and it's still happening today. People are healed, and I bet most of us have at least one or more stories of great experiences of healing that God brought to someone here or someone there. But this doesn't say that God heals some of our diseases. It says that God heals all of our diseases. What is the difference between you and a lost person? Do lost people get cancer and Christians don't? Do lost people have heart attacks and Christians don't? Do lost people get malaria and Christians don't? No. What is the difference? We get just as sick with the same kinds of things as lost people, pagans, atheists, every kind of person. It is the human condition and we all know people or we have been that person who has had serious medical issues but the Bible says to the Christian God heals all of your diseases because we know it will be either here or in eternity but God will bring healing and you say well why would you get excited if that healing doesn't come until eternity oh man I was a senior in high school and I got the flu one day and I had to stay in bed the whole day. I couldn't go to school. I don't see anybody in tears yet. I mean, I was really sick. I was running a fever, having chills. I had to take medicine. Matter of fact, I think I had to miss school for two days. I mean, this was a really big deal. I was a student body president, and I missed some meetings. Uh, I was an athlete. I couldn't go to practice. I had a girlfriend. I couldn't go out with her. I should not have said that when Rhonda was here. But anyway, it was a really big deal, but I don't see anybody wondering what happened. Because who cares if a high school kid gets the flu for a couple of days? I'm well past that. Do you understand what every disease any one of us has is going to look like in eternity? nothing. It is serious now, heartbreaking now, scary now. I had one, a very rare fight with my mom that day about trying to go to school and she would not let me. And it was a point of real tension. But it is forever gone. You see what Jesus did for us? He gave us the end of the story, the end of every chapter of the story, the end of every single thing that happens in our life. And we know the end of every story of every child of God is a happy ending. He pardons all of your sin. He heals all of your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. Where do they put people in jail before there were metal bars? You ever, ever thought about that? Do you think that doing criminal acts is a new invention that people have only started doing it since they invented metal bars? So what did they use for prisons before there were metal bars? Pits. It's where Joseph's brother put him in the pit. Can you imagine how frustrated it would be to be in prison in a pit? What is a pit? It is open to the sky but you are so deep down you can't get to it. You can see the sky, you can feel the temperature, but you are completely cut off from life. Can you imagine the frustration of that? You hear the birds, you watch them fly over. You hear people talking as they go by. It just, just out of your reach and you can't get there. He redeems your life from the pit, pulls you out into the freedom that we have in Christ. 
I could get excited about that, but I better keep moving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not any of his benefits, who pardons all of your iniquity, who heals all of your, your sins, your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. What is the purpose of a crown? A crown shows the truth of something even if it doesn't look like it. A king or a queen may not be the most impressive looking person in the room, but the crown shows they have the authority. The crown is designed to call attention to the authority and the power of the one who wears it. God's crown for you and me is loving kindness and tender mercy. Four worst days of my life. One month after Katrina, the mayor of New Orleans opened our campus, our, this part of New Orleans. And our contractor said, you have four days for people to come and salvage whatever they can, and then I have to have the campus for the rest of the year, it took a year to rebuild it. Four days. Everybody came in shifts to salvage what they could. My job was to go around. I had a cart filled with ice down bottles of water. And they said, okay, Dr. Kelly, what you have to do is go up to people and make them stop. It was brutally hot. Everybody's wearing hazmat suits because at that time we didn't know if the water was contaminated or not. It wasn't, but we didn't know that then. Everybody's having to wear hazmat suits salvaging what they could, brutally hot. They said, you have to go, they'll stop for you, they won't stop for anybody else, and stand there and make them drink a bottle of water and don't leave until they finish a bottle of water. Stay hydrated. So I kept moving all through the campus, all four days, standing there when people opened the door of their home and saw that they lost everything they had. Standing there, I mean, I, remember, <laughs> I was with one student couple, sweet student couple, they'd salvaged a shoebox stuff out of all their possessions we cried we prayed walking back to my cart radio goes off it's the guard front gate dr kelly could you please go back to the state apartments I said okay what's happening they said well a, a bunch of our korean students just arrived and they live back in those apartments and they took eight feet of water and it's pretty bad and they're taking it very hard i said i'm on my way I take three or four steps, my radio goes off again, Dr. Kelly, skip that, don't worry, just go do whatever you're gonna do before we called you. I said, okay, what happened? They said, well, the Korean disaster relief team just showed up. The Korean disaster relief team. Yes, I said, I've never heard of the Korean disaster relief team. They said, neither have we, but they just showed up and asked if they could do anything to help. And we sent them back to the Korean students to be there. And in that moment, the destruction was still all around. But God spoke and said, I am here. And the highlight for me of four days of profound emotion was being crowned with loving kindness and tender mercy. I am here. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not any of his benefits who pardons all of your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness 
and tender mercy that draws your attention away from the evil and heartbreak of the world to see the tender mercy of God. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. My mom lived the last few years of her life here in New Orleans. She had about half the capacity of her heart, terrible arthritis in both knees and in her hands. For her to walk from the back door of the chapel to the front row would be like running a marathon for anybody else. Her life was not easy and my dad had dementia under 24 hour health care. I remember being in the room with my mom, her apartment, when grandkids would come. And I would watch the years drop off of her face as those grandkids walked in the door. Who renews, refreshes, and gives you wings like the eagle. The most disturbing thing about this passage is what it says is going on right now in your life and in mine. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not any of his benefits. That means right now we are quite likely to forget some of God's benefits. Do you know when we sin? When we get the glory of God out of our minds. Distraction. Frustration. Weariness. Temptation. Opposition and life grabs you and shakes you, and you're not thinking about the glory of God. You're wondering, Am I going to survive? You're thinking, How unhappy I am. You're thinking, How dry our marriage has become. You're wondering, What's going to happen with our kids? Will the deacons fire me next week? And we are being shaken by life, and so we stop remembering the benefits of the Lord. Nothing in heaven or earth can shake you loose from the grip of God on your life and ministry. I think you know that in your soul. But do you know it right now? This is the psalmist saying, life can get so in your face you can get so worn out in the race. You can be facing such great challenges and, and you have some problems and you can't see the solution. That's the problem. You can't see the solution. Nothing in heaven or on earth can loosen God's grip on your life and your ministry. So how do we deal with the challenges? We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord knowing if I'm in the worst chapter of my life I've ever been, God is going to redeem it. He can redeem it from the pit. 
if I've made some mistakes, I can bring them to God and he will forgive it and they'll be gone in his sight. I know if I just got some terrible news from the doctor and I'm scared to death, the real question is, do I go to heaven sooner or later? But I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be healed. And I know whatever is going on around me, God is going to crown my life with loving kindness and tender mercy. I will give God my blessing now. So we close, just asking the simple question, how long has it been since you gave God your blessing? Are you here today knowing it's time for me to bless the Lord, not with a word, but with my whole heart, not because of what I see in front of me or around me, but because of what I know about him. And if I have any doubt about him, I look at the cross. And God could not make a clearer statement on how much he loves you, nor could his resurrection be a clearer statement on his power to keep you in his grip. And so we want to close today by giving you an opportunity to bless the Lord if that's where you are. And I'm going to ask us just to take a few moments here at the end. We'll stand. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. But before I lead us in a word of prayer, let's just stand together, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you want to come to make these steps of the chapel a holy altar to God and bless him before you leave, feel free to come. If you want to talk or pray with someone, Dr. Talbert is here. Team and Knight is here. If you see any of our people, here, they'd be happy to pray with you. Let's just come before the Lord. Just a few more moments that I'm going to lead us in prayer.
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I speak from my own heart. Bless you, Lord. All that Chuck Kelly is, I, I bless you, Lord, and thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercy, for your forgiveness, your pardon, for your healing, for your restoration, for your redemption. I bless you, Lord. I bless you because you, you have given me a rearview mirror and I can turn around and look behind me and see that the most difficult moments of my life were also the moments of my Hall of Fame experiences with you. And that the most profound experiences of grace and power and love I have ever had happened in the worst moments of my life. Oh, what a God who is able to take the worst and make it the best, who is able to mark my life not simply by my crises and my challenges, but to take every crisis and mark it with your intervention. I bless you, Lord, for what I see in the rearview mirror. And I thank you for a windshield, Father, that lets me look ahead and know what's coming, for knowing that glory is on its way, that when I woke up this morning, I was one day closer to heaven than I've ever been before in all of my life, and that you took that monster of death pulled every tooth out of it and turned it into an Uber driver, taking us from earth to heaven. Thank you, Father, for knowing that's the end of the story that's waiting. And thank you, Father, for the granite of grace that is under my feet as I live every day. And so I just pray, Father, and I pray on behalf of all of us, all of us here, Father, we are blessing you and we are asking you, please help us not to forget any of your benefits. And when the pressure comes and when the loneliness comes and when the distraction comes, Father, help us to remember those benefits. Help us to come back to this wonderful, precious psalm and rejoice that no matter what we see around us, we know what you are doing in us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for all that you have done and because of who you are and because of what you have done and for the proof, the evidence you have demonstrated through all the years of my life and my walk with you, I do stand before you, Father, and I say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And now I lift up these precious kingdom servants, these husbands and wives who are working hard for your glory, who are paying great prices for their obedience. And Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon them as they go home, that you would give them great conversations as they reflect over this weekend, that you would give them a great Sunday uh, in their church this coming Lord's Day tomorrow. And I pray, Father, that as they go forth from this place, they will go forth just with a reminder of how wonderful a Savior you are and how strong your grip is on their life. Love on them, Father. You called them out of all the people you could have called. You chose them. So fill them, Father. Fill them with that joy of knowing they are in your grip and nothing in heaven and nothing on earth can ever loosen your grip on them. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, our souls, bless his holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.